and I will start with that. Sure. Should I start or? Uh, no, at 5.30, Aman will give the introduction, Dr. Basma, and then uh, it will be followed by your presentation. Oh. Yeah. Aman, you can start. So uh, good evening, everyone. I hereby welcome you all, and we take a great pride and pleasure in bringing you the eighth series of the educational program, Advanced Classes in Dentistry. This program shall be conducted with our esteemed speaker, Dr. Hussain S. Basma. This educational program is brought to you by FDC Limited, makers of the Flamiclev, and therefore, on behalf of FDC Proxima, greetings to everyone. I now, I now request Dr. Basma to enlighten us on the topic of the art of sinus augmentation, the clinical track. Thank you, Aman. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, staying with us on this uh, clinical track, uh, uh, on this uh, series, actually, of lectures that Spirant is, uh, is definitely conducting. Uh, special thanks for uh, for Dr. Va uh, Do Dr. Varma and Dr. Gulshan for their kind invitation always. And before I start, I would like to thank you all again for being here this evening with us. This presentation is going to be focusing this week, actually, in, on this, the art of sinus augmentation, the clinical track. In the last lecture, we focused a little bit on the uh, on the fundamentals of sinus augmentations and on the evidence-based research of sinus augmentation. And to give you a very quick summary of what we talked about last time is that sinus augmentation is, yes, a very, or is a highly predictable uh, procedure and it's, it can be done without any problems. However, we should always be aware that there, with every single surgery that we can do in the human body, there is a risk of com complications. And when we are dealing with a sinus, uh, with a sinus procedure, there might be different types of complications. The most common one 
is the perforation of the schneiderian membrane. So we all know from the anatomy of the sinus that we talked about last time that the schneiderian membrane or the sinus is a is an is a is an air cavity that is that is uh, uh, where the bony housing or the bony walls are literally uh, 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 has the other part of it has what has a schneiderian membrane and inside and this is actually the part that we're going to be lifting wherever we are doing some sinus augmentation the second part of complications or the second complication that could happen with sinus augmentation is basically uh, bleeding or hemorrhage. Uh, why? Because we all know that in all, if we look at the anatomy, there is that anastomosis between the infraorbital artery and the posterior superior alveolar artery that could be passing actually where the window that you're going to be creating in that site. So if you are not aware of the anatomy there and you accidentally injured that blood vessel, you might have a lot of heme. And this you have to manage actually during the procedure. There is always with every surgery, there is a risk of an infection. There is a risk of sinusitis. There is a risk of, uh, of uh, developing pus while you're doing this. And this could be the worst thing that could happen whenever you're doing sinus augmentation. Because if you, if you have a perforation of the schneiderian membrane, you can manage your complication during the surgery. You can put a, uh, you will, we will see, you can put a membrane and you can cover that perforation. When you're doing, when you have bleeding, definitely you can manage this by putting bony wax, by putting bony chips, by putting pressure, by using an electrosurge to cut to ligate the vessels, by suturing that vessels. So you can manage those first two complications. However, when we talk about infection and sinusitis here, we're talking about post-op uh, complications that could happen. Like for example, you do the sinus augmentation, patient comes back after two weeks, and then there is pus coming from everywhere. What do you do in this case? You have to go in, clear all the bone graft that you put in the sinus, give the patient more antibiotics, and then wait for this to heal and then come back and do the procedure again. So it's pretty annoying actually to have this. That's why understanding the anatomy, understanding all the 3D x-rays components that or the information that that uh, x-ray is offering us, it's crucial for successful results. And this is why we always say you have to have a CBCT prior your bone augmentation or your sinus augmentation. Why? Because if there is any sinus infection prior to bone augmentation, this should be a contraindication for doing what? For doing a sinus, uh, for doing a sinus uh, augmentation procedure. So we have to be very careful to avoid the complication from happening. How to avoid complication from happening? We also talked about this last time. With in details, we have to have a good radiographic evaluation. We have to understand how much native bone we have, because based on that, I will know exactly where my window is going to be. I want to know what's the morphology of the sinus. Do we have any septa in the sinus? Do we have a blood vessels that's passing through the sinus? So and this is important because now in these scenarios, you might have a higher chance of perforation of that membrane if you are not paying attention to the anatomy the 3D x-ray is offering. Then we move into the second one, which is the lateral wall thickness. Lateral wall thickness is basically where, you, where, you, where the window is going to be actually placed or where you're going to create your, your window whenever you're doing the sinus augmentation. We talked about this last time. The thicker the wall, the more chance you're going to be perforating. And we talked about options, how we do this. Basically, if you have a thick wall, all what you have to do is to thin it with a burr or a piezo electric device, and then you can go ahead and do your window. Septum is a big deal. We have to try to avoid the septum as much as possible, especially if it's a partial septum, because that is going to be very sharp and you have a higher incidence of perforating the, sin the schneiderian membrane. Uh, the thickness of the schneiderian membrane is, we already talked about this, we also know that we have different kind of thickness that we could have during the during uh, or uh, during any procedure, or so every case is per basically unique. Whenever we do this, we have to know that the thinner the membrane, that there is a higher chance that you're going to perforate. And the thicker the membrane, it's more malleable. You can literally uh, put more pressure on the membrane and it's not going to perforate. So again, but it's not a big deal with every perforation we can manage and we can uh, try to cover that with multiple uh, 
different types of procedures that we're going to talk about today. Residual bone height is also important. Why? Is because that you, this is where you're going to decide where your membrane or how you can design your window to be based on the anatomy, the presence of the adjacent teeth and the residual bone height. Let's say you have a three millimeter, you, uh, three millimeter of native bone height, and then there is the sinus. Your sinus, the, the inferior border of your sinus window has to be five millimeter from the crest. What does that mean? We have a three millimeters of native bone. We should always leave around two millimeter of, uh, of uh, buccal bone on that a window, this is going to be your inferior border, and then you do your sinus window. And this is we're going to talk more in depth about that in the next slides. What's the presence of the artery? We already mentioned that. This is where the anastomosis between the infraorbital artery and the posterior superior alveolar nerve actually is happening. So if in most of the cases, if this is a major vessel, you can see it definitely on the 3D x-ray. And if you see it, you can either avoid it with digital dentistry, or what you can do is basically you can try to, if by accident you hit that thing or you hit that artery, all what you have to do is to ligate, put pressure, put bone wax, everything that could manage that bleeding. Because whenever there is bleeding, it's going to be a very significant bleeding that is going to bother the vision during the procedure. So that's why it's very important to understand the anatomy prior to going in. So let's say we did all of this, okay? And basically what we are trying to do right now is we are trying to jump into, okay, we already studied the anatomy. We already uh, made, made sure that we are very careful with everything we're gonna do. Now it's time to move into the surgery. So there is a lot of things that we should take into consideration be while we're doing the surgery in order for us to limit the amount of complication that could happen during and after the procedure. So in every one of these is very important to understand. Let's talk about the first thing is that we need to understand the incision design because your incision could be a possible complication if you don't, didn't do it the right way. And then we're going to talk about how we're going to do the window. Then we're going to talk about what are the instruments that we're going to use to elevate the, the membrane. We're going to talk a little bit about what is, the, what is the best type of bone graft that we can use. And then what are we going to do after we're done with the bone grafting? And then we're going to talk about what is the best medication regimen that we give the patient post-operatively whenever we do a sinus augmentation procedure. So let's start with the first one. Let's do the incision design. Every one of these cases, you can tell that we already have two types of incision. We have something called the crestal incision, and that's from the name. Crestal means crest. That means I'm doing my incision on that edentulous area that I have. On the first image, on the upper left image, it's literally that area behind the premolar. So this is the, I do first my crestal, uh, my crestal uh, incision. And then because I'm opening a big flap, I, I always drop two verticals. And why I drop two verticals is to have a better access to that window and definitely to release or to relieve the pressure on the soft tissue while I'm pushing the, so while I'm pushing, uh, the flap very apically. Because you can tell how far apical is the window. And if I don't have a vertical, I might lead to a tear in the soft tissue on the margin of that premolar. So basically, anytime I'm doing a sinus, I'm doing two types of incision. I'm doing a, a crestal uh, incision to open the site, and I'm doing two vertical incisions. But Dr. Basma, where do you place your vertical incision? This is very important. If you place your incision directly where your window is going to be, that's gonna to lead to a serious problem. So it's always recommended that you go at least one to two teeth away from the site that you're gonna, that you think or you believe the window is gonna be there. You have to go at least two teeth uh, distance and then you drop your verticals. So let's take the first case. The first case, as you see, I place my, uh, my crestal incision on the bottom left image. 
I did a vertical on the first premolar while the second premolar is there. And then I did my distal vertical releasing incision close to the tuberosity. Why? I want to make sure that my verticals are away from those uh, from the area where I'm going to be uh, grafting. If you look at the middle uh, case, I placed my vertical incision on the first premolar two and my second incision, vertical incision distal to that molar. The same in this, the same in the last image, the first image to the bottom right. I placed my incision two teeth away, but the teeth here are missing, but I still managed that to place my vertical away from what away from the grafted area. So always keep in mind, what did Dr. Basma say? You have to do to, to, to have a rule of two to two. What are these two? We should have two flaps, the buckle and the lingual flap. We should have two incision, two vertical releasing incision. And then the last thing, you should be two teeth away from the grafted sites. Remember this, two to two, you will not forget this. So again, let me repeat that. We have crestal, we have the two verticals. And those two vertical has to be at least two teeth away from the grafted area. And not only that, we have to make sure that we have two flaps, one buccal and one lingual. And this has to be a standard for all your grafting cases. Why? Because we don't care much about, about scar tissue. We're dealing with the posterior jaw. Most of the time we're dealing with a sinus in, in the, it's definitely in the posterior maxilla. So it's not a highly aesthetic area. And always think that whenever you're dropping your vertical, your vertical can go as apical as you want. Why? You don't want to have a vertical incision that stops in the keratinized tissue because what's going to happen if you're pushing that flap apically, you're going to have a lot of pressure on the soft tissue in that area. So we have to make sure that we your vertical incision are deep enough to allow you to manipulate the tissue better. Clear? So now let's move to the second part. The second part is what I just talked about. From the CBCT, I, if you look at that arrow, this is what's called the native bone. The native bone, let's say it's equal to five millimeter. Okay, five millimeter, that's where I'm gonna be placing my, I, I start placing my window at a seven millimeter. Why? This is the, gonna be the inferior border because I don't want my window my border of the window, the inferior border of the window to hit, to be hitting native bone because that's going to be a lot of working there. And what could happen is that I want something to enclose the graft when I'm putting it. So this is, this is going to be actually more helpful that your graft or your window has to be two millimeter apical to the amount of native bone that you have. Also, you can rely on the CBCT, you can do some measurements. For example, you can measure from the tooth distal how far you are going to go, uh, you are going to go posteriorly. And then after that, you can measure how much, how much actually, uh, uh, where's the window is going to be. So again, you should have certain, definitely landmarks that will help you to design or where are you going to place your window. If you have teeth, those teeth could be the markers where your window is going to go. You measure how far is it from the adjacent teeth and how much native bone you have. That's where your window is going to be. And also, another important thing is that if you have, well, Dr. Bass, in some cases are edentulous. Patients have no teeth. Well, what you can do is you can use the patient's denture as a radiographic marker that will help you decide where is your window according to the teeth that are present in the denture, okay? So here comes, here comes uh, uh, the question. How big is my window, okay? Actually, there are different schools. And usually what we are actually looking for is that every case is unique. What you can do, you can do a small, if it's one tooth like you see in the bottom left image, you can do a small window and then you're good to go. But we all know that the bigger the window, the more morbidity for the patient. And the longer time it's going to heal, and the longer amount of, native, of, native, of a vital bone has to be longer time as for the vital bone to form. So in order for us to be doing this, we have to understand that 
if we make a bigger window, it's going to be easier for us to do the sinus augmentation. However, it's going to have more or it's going to require more, uh, more healing time. And there might be some possibility of having some complication post-surgical. It's not, I'm not going to say if you do a bigger window, you're going to have complications. No, but it's definitely going to require more healing time. However, as a standard, the many, like if you will go with a number, I go with an eight by nine millimeter window or eight by eight millimeter window, this will give you access to what? To, uh, uh, to the sinus, uh, uh, the sinus uh, to do the augmentation. However, in some cases, if I, in order for me to avoid opening a big window, I try to open two small windows, keeping that island between those two windows. And this is gonna help me lift the membrane or lift the Schneiderian membrane and access both sides instead of creating a whole big, I remove all this buccal bone and that's gonna require more healing time. So as a, if I go back just a little bit and you notice how big is that window on the top, I can definitely, I can definitely avoid that by placing two small windows. And this is gonna help with having a better collection of the graft and less healing time. So what are the options that we should use in order to do that, in order to do this, actually this, uh, uh, this uh, the, the sinus window preparation. So we have, either we do the rotary instruments or we use the piezoelectric device, or we use this, what's called the SLA, which is the uh, sinus lateral approach actually kit. So basically, if you look at what the literature says right here, the literature actually doesn't have, there is not much uh, difference actually, it's all up to the practitioner's decision. But if you look at what the literature say, the risk of sinus membrane perforation did not show any significant difference between two surgical techniques. And basically here, they are checking the difference between a piezoelectric surgery and a rotary instrument, like a burr and the piezo. And also, uh, there is this meta-analysis that concluded that uh, rotary instruments were associated with a perforation rate of 24%. The piezoelectric were devices with 8% with statistically significant difference between both modalities. So what does that mean? That means that if you use a piezoelectric device because it's not as aggressive as a rotary instrument, you can decrease the chance of perforation. So let's start, take a look at how can we manage a sinus augmentation. So think, look at, at this case. What I want you to see, this is a video actually. This is, a, uh, um, I placed my crestal incision as you see already. I did my uh, vertical incision two teeth away from that grafted or from that mem site where I'm gonna be placing my window. And I did another vertical incision posterior to what? Posterior to uh, the tuberosity or at the tuberosity level. And this is actually the piezoelectric device. You can see that now I'm gently trying to do what? I'm gently trying to create the window. And how do I know I'm approaching the, uh, the sinus is that in some cases, like here where the bone was very thin, you feel the drop. The Schneiderian membrane was a little bit, was a little bit thicker. I, did, I was lucky I didn't have any perforation. And while I'm doing this, I keep on checking if that island that I created is moving. So basically, uh, when you are using the piezo, you can start seeing a black, uh, like a gray color underneath those areas, as you see right here. The more you see it, the more you are trying to check the island. That island that you created like this, it has to be separated completely. You are going to check. You're going to make sure that this island is separated. There is no bone that's going to be like this, uh, that's going to be connected. Now I switch from that round burr. I switch to this, uh, it's called an elephant foot burr that uh, it's insert. And the whole purpose of this is try to separate or give access by lifting that membrane a little bit away from where? Away from the uh, bony housing. And then I move to the curettes. And those curettes, they have different angulations, they have different uh, shapes and different uh, sizes. And the whole purpose is to give you access to the different uh, sides of that window to elevate the membrane. The key for those instruments is that you have to stay in contact with the bone all the time. 
you have to stay in contact. Like you are mainly trying to move that instruments on inside the sinus wall. And by doing that, the back of that instruments is pushing or lifting that membrane. So this is very important. You're not lifting the instruments because that might lead to the perforation. You're literally trying to put that tip of the instrument inside the window and touching the bone and then moving that instruments while touching the bone. And that's going to create a lift of that membrane while we're doing while we're doing this. So basically, those different angulations, as you will see here, I'm in touch with the bone. All what I have to do is literally keep on moving my instrument. And by moving my instruments, that's going to lift the membrane. And those, as you will see, I'm changing a lot my instrumentation. And the whole purpose is I want to choose which one is the easiest to give me access to this site. You see here, this is an easier access to, to uh, access, uh, an easier instrument to use for the apical part or the coronal part. Here, it's better to use for the mesial part. You see, I'm in direct contact with the bone, direct contact with the bone, and that's going to help me lift the membrane. This is very important. Whenever I'm lifting the membrane, I have to make sure I'm going, as you will see right here, from the buckle all the way to the lingual. This is very important. Make sure whenever you're lifting your window, you're going not only on the buckle, not only on the crest where your implant is going to go, but you have to elevate your sinus too all the way to the palatal wall. Why? Because whenever, if you don't do this, what's going to happen? You will take a CBCT after the, after the soft tissue or after the bone heal. You're going to find bone on the buckle, but you cannot find bone on the lingual because you missed it. That's why whenever you're lifting the membrane, you have to go inside the buckle, like on the, on the lingual side of the buckle bone and try to move all the way to the, palate, to the buckle side of the palatal bone. This is very important. And if you have a membrane perforation like this, now it's not a case that we are aborting the surgery. We don't abort surgeries if we have membrane perforations. What we do is we try to manage. And this is actually the Mike, Dr. Michael Pika's technique where you have to cut the membrane, the cross-linked membrane actually, and you try to cut it in this way, fold it on its own, insert it in the, insert it in the uh, window and keep part of that membrane outside. And the whole reason why we are putting this membrane outside is that most of the time, this is kind of a schematic drawing trying for me to try and to explain this for you. If I, uh, if I put uh, the snyderia, the, the uh, uh, collagen membrane inside, completely inside the sinus, when I'm putting the graph, what's gonna happen, it, this membrane might be displaced. And if I put the bone graph, the, the perforation might be exposed and then the bo bone graft can go in the sinus. However, the whole purpose here is I'm gonna try to keep part of that, part of that uh, uh, collagen membrane outside. I try to fix it actually on the buccal wall. And now I graft the sinus with the bone graft and that's gonna help me prevent that displacement of the membrane. So let's take a look actually. This is another case where again, all what I'm doing is trying to place two crestal incisions and then I'm so, uh, one crestal incision, two vertical incisions, two teeth away. I'm trying to use a different device here. This is called the SLA uh, system. And this actually will eat the buccal bone and push the membrane a little bit while I'm pre preparing. But you can tell actually in this case, it's not the matter of using the wrong instrument or the wrong burr. But if you are just looking at that membrane, you can tell how thin is that membrane. And just by looking, you will see that this membrane is perforating. No matter what you're going to use, this membrane is going to perforate. So basically, what we did here is exactly the same thing. The Mike Picos uh, management of the membrane perforation by using a long-lasting, resorbable collagen membrane. And then we fold it this way. We put a tack on the buckle. And then we insert the membrane to cover that perforation. And once we do that, what do we do? We fill that, we fill that sinus with bone grafts, and then we are going to put a membrane outside, and then we close it up. And then this is actually how that good, whenever you want to check an x-ray, you look at this dome. 
Whenever you see a dome, that means it's a well-contained and you already stabilize the membrane in and you cover that perforation. If you don't see a good dome, that means you might not be, you were not close to do actually what you're not very, you might have missed a part of that perforation and you have a scattered uh, uh, bone particles in the sinus. Let's take another case. And again, here we're doing, we're doing the same thing. We're doing a sinus augmentation. Okay, we open the flap. We have a massive perforation here. All what I have to do here is do the same thing. Two tacks, fix the membrane, push the rest of the membrane inside the sinus, try to adjust that membrane in the sinus in order for me to make sure the perforation was what? The perforation was uh, completely sealed. And then I put my graft, I let it heal, and that's when I come back. This is after six months. See how much bone we have. See that I was able, no matter what, to place my implants now in the grafted sinus, and now the patient is in the healing phase. Another option that we can use uh, nowadays is, in some cases, is use PRF, which is basically uh, we draw blood, we put it in the centrifuge, we are able to get those PRF membranes. And what? Uh, just to let you know that most of the time we get questions about is a PRF good for bone or for soft tissue? And you have no, you should have no doubt that PRF is mainly for soft tissue healing, nothing else. PRF has no uh, benefits on bone augmentation. It only have benefits on what? It only have benefits on so on soft tissue healing. That's why we we use it at the end before we we suture to help with the healing. But sometimes we get the benefit that instead of mixing the bone graft with saline, we mix it with, uh, with LPRF in order to have better growth factors that allows for better healing in the first couple of weeks. So basically what we do here is because we might be, uh, we know that there might be some micro perforations, we insert the, the uh, PRF membrane inside the sinus. Also, we mix the bone graft with the LPRF and the uh, liquid PRF. And then what we do is we insert the bone graft in the sinus, as you will see right here. You can use this, uh, you can use actually this uh, a tool, which is like a needle that you insert in the sinus, uh, the bone graft in the sinus, or what you can do is just use uh, any kind of bone, bone holder uh, or a curette, whatever. And then you make sure whenever you are grafting, you're grafting the mesial surface first, and then the coronal aspect first. Why? Because this is where you should care the most, especially like in this case, your bone graft has to be mainly on the buckle, uh, on the mesial and on the apical part where your implant is gonna go. Then we put a membrane on top of that window that we created. We put one tack and it's very important that you should also use, you know, what type of bone graft should be used, right? Because definitely in this case, we're not using autogenous because we know that the sinus cavity is well, uh, it's definitely well uh, shaped defect that helps us or that have enough blood supply sometimes or well contained defect, let's say. And then you don't have, you don't need to do to use autogenous bone. So bone substitute actually is what is enough. But here comes the question, well, Dr. Basma, what do you think is the best mix for well, uh, for bone graft here. Would you use allograft? Would you use xenograft? Would you mix them together? Would you use biologics? Well, personally, every case is unique. And my, if I want to tell you my approach is that I always look at how much native bone I have. Let's say I have three or four millimeter of native bone. What I use here, I use here xenograft. If I have at least four millimeter of native bone or three millimeters at least of native bone, I definitely go with xenograft, that's totally fine. If you have no or less than a millimeter or less than two millimeters of native bone, I always go with the allograft. And if I wanna save you yourself some headache, nowadays all my grafted sinuses are solely allograft only. I'm not using xenograft in the sinus. And I don't see the reason why not to use only allograft because using allograft decreases or 
will make you enter the sinus in a shorter healing time, in a shorter healing time. Number two, there is always a debate. Oh, well, there is what's going to happen is there's going to be a sinus shrinkage or the graft shrinkage over time. Well, if you don't put the sinus, uh, if you put, put, don't put the implant in the sinus, there might be some shrinkage. But I personally did a study that's going to be published soon uh, on the difference with, or on the sinus shrinkage using a 3D dimensional, uh, dimensional uh, 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 software trying to check how much shrinkage we have. And this is not going to, it's definitely not significant. Uh, so that's why anytime you use uh, you want to use a bone graft, go with an aloe graft if you are, if you are uh, uh, thinking about what type of bone graft you're going to use. Another reason why I don't use allo, uh, xenograft, especially when there is not enough uh, a residual bone height, is that because I don't want my implant to go in xenograft full particles, uh, sinus grafted. Okay, so I don't want to have to place my implants in a sinus that's completely full with xenograft particles. Why? Because if I do that, the implant can osteointegrate. It's not going to be a problem. But if peri-implantitis happen, I know that I want my implant to be placed in a good amount of native bone, a good amount of vital bone. When you have a complete xenograft, that's going to be very minimal. And I know that xenograft is not going to resolve very easily. So that's why my go-to is allograft. And if I, want, if I want to try to check which one, I, I go, always go with a large particle uh, allograft or xenograft. It doesn't matter. So after I, I'm done with, the, uh, after I'm done with uh, the bone grafting, I always place a window. Mem uh, over the window, I place a membrane. And this is actually a cross-link membrane. And this is going to definitely help with, uh, according to the literature, uh, as you see in these in these uh, in these studies, this is a systematic review that showed if you put a barrier membrane, increases the percentage of newly formed bone and diminishes proliferation of non mineralized tissue. Basically, it plays like a like a seal that prevents the soft tissue from from entering inside that sinus window a little bit. Also, barrier membrane reduces the post-operative dislodgement of the bone graft. So basically, if you put a bo bone graft, you put a membrane, you make sure that that bone graft is gonna not going to come out. And if you have bone particles in the flap, that can create some post-operative morbidity and swelling. So uh, also, the best results were obtained using rough uh, surface implants with membrane coverage over the lateral window. So we have to use window or membranes over the uh, window that you just created. So that's how the dome should look like. You see that you can draw a line where your graft is. That's how your window should look or how your X-ray should look after a ridge augmentation or a sinus augmentation. So what do you do after grafting? What do you do after grafting? Basically, you give the patient augmentin 875 milligram two times a day for you give that for one week, starts one uh, the day before of the surgery. In case of large perforations, add flagell, methronidazole, 500 milligram, three times a day for one week. This is the antibiotic regimen. You can give ibuprofen and you can give dexamethasone in case you had a big perforation, in case you had a very sensitive patient that he doesn't want to uh, swell much. Uh, always there is a chance of bruising. This is, a, this is very important. You can always tell the patient that if I do the sinus augmentation on the right side, there might be bruising underneath your eye. Also, there might be a chance that your nose in that site is going to bleed a little bit. Always try to avoid bending down, especially in the first couple of days. Try to avoid exercises. Try, try to avoid sniffing your, your, uh, your nose. So it's very important to make sure we're relieving all the pressure from the, sin from the sinus during the first couple of weeks. So it's important, to, it's important to do that. So let's talk a little bit about the healing right now. Again, my always go-to is how much native bone we have, okay? So basically, if we don't have enough native bone, I graft the sinus. Let's say I have a fully pneumatized sinus. I placed my graft. I wait between six to nine months for the bone graft to heal. And then I come back, I place my implant at six to nine months. 
I wait for three months and then I load my implants. However, if I have more than, or uh, I would say uh, four to five millimeter of native bone, I can place my implant simultaneously with the graft, let it heal for five, four to five, four to six months, come back, wait, uh, place my implants at four to six months, and then wait for another three months for the implant healing, and then I can load my implants. So if I have less than three millimeters or less than four millimeters of native bone, I'm placing my graft only. If I have less than uh, three to five milli, more than three and less than five millimeter of native bone, I go with an implant and a lateral window. If I have more than five and I wanna do a window, I do, I, uh, if I wanna do a sinus augmentation, I do a vertical lift. And we can have a whole discussion on vertical lifts later on. So it's important to know that the amount of vital bone of native bone is your decision of what's your surgery gonna look like. If you have uh, uh, some, if you have, again, some native bone that allows you to place your implant stable, go with an implant and the graft, of course. If you, are, if you, if you don't have enough native bone that might cause some displacement of the implant in the sinus, definitely go with what? Definitely go with, uh, with the graft first, let it heal and come back. So let's look at this case. This is a patient that presented with what? With, uh, with, uh, with a chief complaint that he wants, he wants teeth, he's, a, he's, he's done with dentures, and he wants something fixed like implants. So we said, you know what, let's take a, a panoramic and see where are your sinuses. This is a case where you can tell or you can see what do we have here. We have sinuses that are completely pneumatized. They are on the ridge completely. And this is the sinus here that I don't want to use xenograft, especially on, uh, especially on the uh, area next to the uh, on the crest of the ridge. So here, what you can tell, I want I can use only allograft, or what I can use is a sandwich. Like I use the first the coronal uh, area, I put allograft. The second or the apical area, I do what I do xenograft. So the sinuses are completely pneumatized, and not only that. The sinuses are literally reaching the lateral incisor, which is very close, which is very significant in this case. So here you see like the sinuses, especially on the upper left image, how the sinuses are almost approaching each other. So here we know that we're gonna do a massive, and this is actually the X-ray, how it shows you that we have we have a complete sinus pneumatization, pneumatization pneumatization and um, uh, you can tell that we don't have enough bone in the front we have uh, we have good bone and then what we can do is basically here if you see that you're moving to the other side now once we reach the lateral incisor you can see that the sinus is very large very huge there is no native there's no a native bone there so I have to do a very significant grafting so I opened a full thickness flap here and immediately by opening a full thickness flap in the posterior area, you can tell the difference between the color of the ridge and the color of the ridge in the anterior area. You see that gray color in the back? That tells me that in this area, the sinus is, or the, the, the bone is very thin and that grayness is what's reflecting the dark part of the sinus. So here in this case, as you will see, I already, I'm already barely touching and the sinus is already perfect. So see right here, I, I did my piezo, my sinus. There's a small perforation, which is that black point that you see right here. I do it, I did my lift. I'm able to see actually that I'm able to seal the member, the, that lift a little bit. And then I put my bone graft on this side. I put a membrane and then I move to the other side. But what I want you to notice is that notice how even when away for uh, more coronal to that where the, my sinus window is, you can tell that there are perforations. See how much thin was that wall. So then what we did is basically we did the same thing on the other side. We grafted the sinus and we did ridge augmentation in the front and then we closed it back. And then we, we, look, we took a panoramic x-ray that day and I'm so happy with how collective and how uniform is that uh, augmentation that I did. So what we did here is this is actually the grafted area. We took, we, this is at two weeks. This is at four weeks, remove the x-ray, but look at the scan. Now I was able to look at the bottom left image. You can see how much bone 
we increased. We used 11 cc's in this patient of bone. So now we have, we can easily open the sites and this is how actually the site look after augmentation. So whenever we reach the molar area, now we have a very wide ridge. We have 13 millimeter of height. This is 15 millimeter of height, more closer to the premolar. Now we did the ridge augmentation, see how much bone graft we augmented in the, in the, in the anterior area. And then what we did is basically the following, seven and eight millimeter in the front. Then we reach the back. We have, we have uh, uh, a 16 millimeter of native bone and uh, I'm sorry, of grafted bone. And that's all the way to the back. Now it's just a matter of opening the site and then do what? Do place all the implants and then let it heal. And now opening the site, uncovering those implants and now putting the restoration. And you can tell that all my implants are in grafted bone. Patient is doing fine. Now we're in the process of giving the patient the final prosthesis and the patient is happy. We definitely could have avoided all this grafting by doing some zygomatic implants. Uh, zygomatic implants. However, the patients didn't want that. The patient said, well, I'm fine with having that much grafting. I'm fine with stay, staying without the denture for the time of the healing. So that's why we said, you know what? Let's go ahead and do the grafting. But it's definitely major grafting. It's definitely more uh, work on the patient. But at the end, we were able to place eight implants. So that's before we removed the bottom teeth. We did plasti. We placed four implants, all on four. And on the top, we placed seven implants. And now the patient is ready for the final prosthesis. So as a summary for everything, we just talked about in the in the last two sessions, actually, we have to use rough implants. I think there is no other options right now whenever we're doing sinus oh. augmentation. We have to use rough surface implants. Also, we have to do what? We have to be very careful to know, to understand the anatomy prior to do what? Prior to uh, 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 sinus augmentation. We have to try to study the anatomy of every single sinus. Every case is unique. Try to study the anatomy of every single sinus you're dealing with. In addition to that, try to understand why we talked about allograft in some cases and maybe xenograft in other cases. Also, you can do a mix. You can use the benefit of allograft and the benefits of xenograft. Also, you all after you do the grafting, always put a wind uh, membrane over the window. We talked about the benefits of doing that. Limit the amount of displacement, limit the amount of invasion of the soft tissue. The use of the bone substitutes is the go-to definitely in these cases. You don't, you, you don't have to use autogenous. You don't need to use autogenous. And definitely all the literature showed that implant placed in grafted sinuses are exactly, have the survival rate as implants placed in native bone. So it's very, one of the key things from these two lectures actually is that you have to understand that if you understand the anatomy, if you study the anatomy of your sinus, this is one of the most predictable procedures. It's a well encapsulated, but you have to be able to manage complications if it happens. And if it happens, you should never abort the procedure. I only abort procedure if I'm, if for, if I'm not paying attention well for the CBCT. I open the sinus and everything is, 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 there is pus in the sinus. There was an active infection. Okay, but this has to be what, have to be studied well. Ask the patient if he has some uh, sinus problems before the surgery. Give the patient some augmentin the day before the surgery and then after the procedure as well. So in order for that to, to happen, you can, you're trying to limit the amount of complications that could possibly happen and, and be, be successful. I think with that, we come to the end of this uh, presentation. I hope I shared with you some information about sinus augmentation. Uh, again, it's a very predictable procedure, uh, but try always to understand that if complications happen, you should be aware of, and also you should always manage your complications. With that, I wanna thank you all, and I'll, until I see you next time for with a different topic. Thank you so much. Sure. Well, with this, we have come to the end of the very educative and interactive session. I'm sure the audience would have gained a lot from today's discussion. 
a big word of thanks to dr basma for sparing his valuable time and being with us i would also like to thank our educational partners fdc limited and cme partners fire and communication for conducting of the program so happy weekend to all until we meet next again